to Ohio gubernatorial Democratic primary debate. Sponsored by the Ohio Debate Commission. Coming to you live from Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio. Funding for this debate is provided by AARP Ohio. This program is made possible by the following organizations, the Shar and Chuck Fowler Family Foundation, the Cleveland Foundation, the George Gund Foundation, and the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Murray and Agnes Seasongood Good Government Foundation, Tecovis Foundation, City Club of Cleveland, and the Ohio Association of Broadcasters. Hello, and on behalf of the Ohio Debate Commission, welcome to Voters First, the 2022 Ohio Gubernatorial Democratic Primary Debate. I'm Lucy May, host of 91.7 WVXU's Cincinnati Edition. Thank you for joining us here live from the Paul Robeson Cultural and Performing Arts Center on the campus of Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio. Today, we hear from the Democratic contenders vying to become the next chief executive for the state of Ohio. The candidates with us this evening are Nan Whaley and John Cranley. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. The participants were selected in accordance with the guidelines of the Ohio Debate Commission, a coalition of state news organizations, universities, and civic groups whose mission is to create better debates for better elections. The format and rules for this debate were agreed to by both of the candidates. Participants will have 30 seconds for opening remarks. Afterwards, questions will begin. You will each have 90 seconds to answer, followed by a 30-second rebuttal at my discretion. Questions for this debate come from the Ohio Debate Commission and residents across the Buckeye State. We remind the audience to mute your phones and refrain from applause, making noise, or attempting to participate or influence the debate. No photography or recording is allowed. A random drawing determined the order of opening remarks and questions. With that, let's get ready to debate. Nan Whaley, you have 30 seconds for your opening statement. Thank you, Lucy. For the last three decades, we've had the same well-held lobbyists and politicians running our state house. And what has it got us? They've been lining their political pockets, and Ohio families have gotten further and further behind. It is unacceptable. I'm Nan Whaley, and I'm running for governor because, my, because it is a pretty simple reason. I believe Ohio deserves better. I will make sure your pay goes up, your bills go down, and we finally have a state government that's working for you. Thank you. Now you, John Cranley. It's great to be here at this historic uh, black college, Central State. As governor, I will have your back. I'm John Cranley, and I'm running for governor because Ohio deserves a comeback. And I've been leading comebacks my entire life. As the co-founder of the Ohio Innocence Project, we have freed people from prison who were innocent, bringing back their freedom. As mayor of Cincinnati, I helped lead the only comeback of a major city in Ohio, where growth is up and we'll do the same for Ohio. Terrific. Our first question goes to Nan Whaley. And our first question comes from Scott in Arlington. It's an overarching question about bipartisanship and doing what's best for Ohio. He wrote, with so many people practically at each other's throats over a host of issues, how do you see your role to bring Ohio together? I think most Ohioans want their politics to work for their families and make sure that their families are better off. Uh, and sadly, we don't see that a lot at the State House. Uh, what we see is a lot of um, partisan bickering and a lot of just one way is the highway kind of, kind of work. And as mayor of Dayton, we've had to bring people together, like passing high quality universal preschool, where the Dayton Chamber of Commerce, teachers, everyone came together to pass it to make our kindergartners ready for school and to cut really costly childcare costs for families. That's the kind of work you do as a mayor. And I'm proud of the work I've also done to, pass, to help President Biden pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill as president of the US Conference of Mayors, bringing 500 mayors from over 50 states of both parties to say, look, we need to have broadband roads and bridges for our communities. And what has Mike DeWine during that time, done during that time? Con said, said what's politically convenient over and over again, but when the rubber meets the road, he is only willing to stand, to stand with the radicals in his party. We have seen it time and time again. He is too weak to really lead Ohio. Now, I'm really proud to have the support 
of U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown, 190 other elected officials across the state, because they know I am the candidate that can bring people together and to get things done for our communities and our families in Ohio. Thank you. Mr. Cranley, same question to you. With so many people practically at each other's throats over a host of issues, how do you see your role to bring Ohio together? Teresa Fetter, who is here, my uh, running mate, the longest serving Democratic woman in the General Assembly, as she and I have traveled the state, what we hear over and over again is the same thing. Ohio needs a comeback. This is the state of John Glenn and Neil Armstrong, of Thomas Edison and the Wright brothers, the state of Toni Morrison and Jesse Owens. The future used to happen here, but after three, 30 years of one party corrupt rule, the average Ohioan is making less money than the average American. We need a comeback. In Cincinnati, we grew wages. We increased the size of the middle class. We reduced poverty one and a half times faster than the state of Ohio. Teresa and I have a plan to rebuild Ohio. Guaranteed 30,000 jobs that pay 60,000 a year to build high-speed broadband and clean energy. We're gonna pay for that by legalizing marijuana, taxing it, and putting the taxes into those jobs. And then we're gonna put real money into people's pockets with a dividend like they have in Alaska and North Dakota. These are real fresh ideas and guess what? They're popular in small towns and rural areas in big cities. They unite Democrats and Republicans. I have a long reputation in history of working in a bipartisan manner to get things done. That's why Cincinnati is the only comeback city in Ohio and that's what Therese and I will do for you. Our next question goes to you first, Mr. Cranley. And our next question comes from Colin in Oregon, Ohio. He says, while many areas of our state, like Central Ohio and Cincinnati, are prospering, areas like Toledo, Akron, and especially Youngstown are fighting to keep up economically. If elected, what would you do to bring equality and economic development to all corners of the state? Cincinnati was like all the cities that Colin mentioned. It was in decline my entire life. It's in a comeback now because we have put democratic values into practice. It started with racial justice. In Cincinnati, 20 some years ago, we had multiple killing of unarmed black men by our police and our city had injustice exposed. I'm proud to say that I was part of a, a large group of people that helped to change police community relations where we were one of the only major cities in America last year where shootings were down, but our arrests are down over 20 years by 50% per year. We've made our city safer by arresting fewer people. Diversity and inclusion is the predicate of our city's comeback. Democratic values work. I also led the first $15 living wage in the city of Cincinnati in the state, the largest solar farm ever built in America. We grew Black-owned business contracts from 2% to 17%. We doubled public transit in Cincinnati and Hamilton County, and we have two years of preschool for all Cincinnati public school kids. In short, we put democratic values into practice. As governor, we'll bring those same values to the whole state because our policies work, our values work, and Republican values of trickle-down and divisive social policy fails and people are worse off, people in Cincinnati are better off. Same question to you, Ms. Whaley. Yes, uh, you know, I've been traveling the state, obviously, and have been to 87 of the 88 counties so far, and I see local leaders doing their level best to really try to work and grow their communities and solve problems in their communities. Great local leaders all across the state, but they don't have a partner at the state house. And why is that? The State House has been called by the FBI the most corrupt in the country. Folks that are running our State House right now are more interested in lining their pockets than taking care of places like Marietta or Mansfield, places that have opportunities for growth. Now, I'm excited because in our jobs plan at nanwhaley.com jobs, we talk about really investing in small business, making sure that the state is a real pop, a partner with small businesses instead, instead of just big, big projects, which happen to have big ribbons for people to cut. 
We have to make sure that we're investing in all communities because the answer can't be for someone in Marietta or someone in Lima that if they want their kids and grandkids to stay in Ohio, they have to move to the Columbus metro region. We need to make sure that one good job is enough no matter what community you live in and, com and community leaders all across the state are doing their level best in this work. They're just not getting the real partnership that they deserve from the Ohio State House. Our next uh, two, next we have two questions involving energy and gas prices, and the first one will go to you first, Ms. Whaley. Tim in Mansfield and Denise in Akron both asked questions about the state energy policy. The first of those questions is twofold, focusing on Ohio's energy policy. Ohio has been criticized for moving backward on en energy policy with House Bill 6, Senate Bill 52, and other policies. What do you plan to do in regards to that energy policy? And as a second part to that question, what will you do to help Ohioans make the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy from their homes to their cars to the industry here? Look, Ohio led the last industrial revolution, and there is no reason why we can't lead this next revolution in renewable energy. But of course, because the first energy corruption scandal, the largest in Ohio history happened, rolling back all of the renewable energy policies we have in the state. Now, we need to invest in the future and future technologies. This is in our jobs plan to really make sure that we are building the solar panels and wind turbines right here in Ohio, which are good paying jobs that provide for a family. And frankly, if you look at the numbers, Michigan and Pennsylvania are eating our lunch when it comes to this good paying jobs and manufacturing because the legislators and Governor Mike DeWine decided to, inv to invest in, in old technology rather than investing in new. Under the Whaley administration, we'll make sure that we're investing in renewable energy. It's why I'm proud that I have the endorsement of the Ohio Environmental Council, making sure that we're investing in battery technology so we build the new cars of the future. That's the kind of leadership we need to make sure that we are bringing good paying jobs everywhere across the state and we're really investing in our future workers. We're not seeing that right now at the State House because they are politically motivated by whatever Well Hill donor comes through their door rather than what Ohio families truly need, which is one good job to provide for their family. Same question to you, Mr. Cranley. What do you plan to do in regards to the state's energy policy, and what will you do to help Ohioans make the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy from their homes to their cars to the industry here? When Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, I had a press conference when I was still mayor of Cincinnati, and I promised that Cincinnati would meet the climate reduction goals, the carbon reduction goals, and we have. People all around the world agreed, and America agreed to pick up the slack. People say that, but very few did it. I'm proud to say that I led the effort to build the largest solar farm ever built in America by a city. And the city government services of the city are now carbon neutral. We have 330,000 individual solar panels, 750 football fields, worth of soil. And by the way, we're not paying up for it in Cincinnati. We're saving money. Clean energy works. And I promise you as governor, through purchasing of energy on behalf of the state, I can expand buying consortiums like that throughout the state. But that's not all. As Nan said, HB6 is the worst and most corrupt bill in the history of the state. And it gutted clean energy standards. I will fire the public utility commissioners that Mike DeWine appointed that gave us that bill and replaced them with clean energy advocates that are public utility commissioners, not private utility commissioners. We can both insist that our utilities invest in clean energy, clean up the corruption, and of course, Teresa and I are also gonna offer an energy dividend of $500 per family per year, like they have in Alaska and North Dakota. This next question goes to you first, Mr. Cranley. Though, uh, though gas prices in the last few days seem to have stabilized, prices are still roughly $1.30 more per gallon than a year ago. Will you consider any changes in Ohio's gas taxes to ease the load on working families? If not, why not? And what would you do instead? Absolutely. Uh, Teresa and I would immediately temporarily reduce the gas tax to give people a break at the pump. See, we believe in actually helping the middle class and raising 
their incomes, not robbing from them. Mike DeWine raised the gas tax, refuses to budge even in this extreme inflation, and of course passed the HB6 utility hike, which is a corruption tax that comes out of everybody's pocket every month to bail out a coal company in Indiana. Not only, as I mentioned, am I gonna fire the utility commissioners, but on top of that, we are gonna offer a natural gas dividend to the people of Ohio, $500 per year to families that make $75,000 or less to help with inflation. Now, it's interesting that Republicans in Alaska and Republicans in North Dakota, they provide a dividend to their people. But Mike DeWine and the Republicans in Columbus, they take money from us and give it to the special interest. Teresa and I are gonna take money from the special interest and give it to you. This is real plans. Lower gas taxes, a dividend, clean up the corruption, and get rid of the corruption tax of HB6. Ms. Whaley, the same question to you. Uh, will you consider any changes in Ohio's gas taxes to ease the load on working families? If not, why not? And what would you do instead? We see that Ohio families are hurting quite a bit with the rising costs from childcare to, to um, uh, compressed natural gas costs that went up 45% this past winter, and I actually called on Governor, Governor DeWine this past winter to put a cap on utility, utility costs, particularly when it comes to compressed natural gas. And of course, he did nothing. As governor, we'll make sure that we lower costs for everyday Ohioans, like utility costs and like investing in child care. What we've seen over the past, uh, past couple years, frankly, across America, is two million American women have opted out of working because they simply cannot pencil childcare out for their families. Childcare right now costs about $14,000 for a family every single year. And by the state actually investing it, we can raise wages for child care workers who are taking care of our best and most precious asset, our children, and then also making sure that uh, we have child care available for every single family. Look, I think we definitely recognize and know that the cost for a family is getting harder and harder to make ends meet. Uh, and this is personal to me. As someone that grew up working class, I've seen how hard it is personally from my mom and dad when my dad got laid off trying to make ends meet and for families to do whatever means possible to make sure that they get th their kids fed to bed and pay the home mortgage. Uh, we need a governor from the middle class that really understands that. This next question goes to you first, Ms. Whaley. Several Ohioans wrote questions about gun violence, including Donna from Columbus, John from Newton Falls, and Jim from Xenia, among others. This one is a combination from Jim and Donna, who wrote, year after year, it seems there are more mass shootings, some at schools, that threaten our security. Governor DeWine recently signed a bill making access to guns easier and repealing safety measures, such as required concealed carry permits. How do you intend to address gun safety in Ohio and protect people from more incidents of gun violence and mass shootings? On August 4th, 2019, I witnessed the day after when we had lost nine of our neighbors in Dayton and 27 more injured. And we held a vigil in the same place where we had lost our neighbors just hours earlier. And Governor Mike DeWine took to the stage to speak. The people in Dayton shouted in frustration, do something. And Governor DeWine said that he would indeed do something to deal with, common sense, to deal with gun violence and create gun, gun safety rules. Never in my worst nightmare did I think that the thing he was going to do was to actually make it worse? Our communities are now less safe because of extreme radical agenda items like stand your ground and permitless concealed carry, which actually makes our police officers less safe. We deserve better. As governor, I'll fight for universal background checks, something that nine out of 10 Ohioans agree with, and we'll make sure that we get it done. You know, nine out of 10 Ohioans don't agree that the Ohio State Buckeyes are the best football team. <laughs> we need to make sure that we're bringing common sense agenda items to the state. 
Mike DeWine is too weak to get this done because at the end of the day, we've seen this on gun violence, on redistricting, on COVID. He does what is convenient at the time politically, and then when the rubber meets the road, he is too weak to stand up to radicals. We deserve better. Same question to you, Mr. Cranley. How do you intend to address gun safety in Ohio and protect people from more incidents of gun violence and mass shootings? Well, first of all, I agree with Nan. Mike DeWine did make it worse. Signing that outrageous bill, as well as Stand Your Ground, is a stain on his soul. You know, Mike DeWine and so many Republicans, they like to act like they're on the side of law enforcement. Well, law enforcement said this will get cops killed. This will get firefighters killed. Mike DeWine has basically said it's open season on a cops. I know better than you how to keep communities safe. When Ann and I have both had to deal with mass shootings, it's awful. You comfort the families next time. Second, gun violence is obviously covered in mass shootings. It's obviously covered in urban violence. It's also the leading cause of gun violence in America is suicide. Gun violence is a public health epidemic. You know, I discovered during the mass shooting in Cincinnati on Fountain Square that the same week there was a drive-by shooting in a public housing project that shot two people, didn't get any attention. Inner city violence and suicides are, are caused most of the time by a lost or stolen gun. And so when Nan and I pushed for background checks and didn't get them, I led the effort to create a gun buying consortium across this country to pull cities who are buying guns for our police to put pressure on the gun industry as consumers of guns to have better practices to keep guns out of the wrong hands. This is leadership. This is action. And I promise you, I will push for background checks, red flag laws, but as an executive, you're, you're I will time, lead as well. Thank you. This next one goes first to you, Mr. Cranley. It's on COVID-19. The pandemic has impacted the country and Ohioans for more than two years now. There has been controversy about vaccine and mask mandates at work, school, and beyond. How do you think Ohio should move forward to come out of the pandemic stronger than ever? And do you support vaccine and mask mandates? This has been an unbelievably difficult time to be in positions of leadership. Nan, myself, the governor, have all had to lead during this just craziest of time. I see my son who is here and him being out of school, like so many other kids and families dealing with this. Many people have died. One of my best friend's parents died of COVID. We're all still dealing with the after effects of this ongoing pandemic. What I can promise you is this, that as Governor, Teresa and I will fully staff public health, public health. We will make sure that we have a multiple year supply of, pub, of PPEs. We will have an infrastructure of human resources of contact tracing so that we will not be caught unawares as we were this time. Because of course there'll be more pandemics in the future. Fundamentally, I believe this country and the state has defunded public health for a very long time. And Teresa and I are gonna fix that. And as we fix that, we're also gonna repair the mental health damages that were done during so much isolation. We will invest in optional opportunities for education, remediation, optional help for businesses that struggled. And we will continue to provide the medical care, including mental health care, that this state and the people of this state so desperately need. Same question to you, Ms. Whaley. How do you think Ohio should move forward to come out of the pandemic stronger than ever? And do you support vaccine and mask mandates? Look, I think over the past couple years, we've seen um, some tremendous leadership out of our local leaders who have really led through this pandemic. And frankly, at the beginning of the pandemic, when Dr. Amy Acton was in charge of public health, we saw tremendous action out of the state. But again, we saw where Mike DeWine just could not stand up to extremists in his party. And the best example is in 2020, when the vaccine, we had no vaccine and we had no testing, we actually saw him on one day say he'd have a mask mandate and less than 24 hours would flip because he could not stand up to radicals. Now look, 
As mayor of Dayton, I was the first city in the state to pass a mask mandate to keep our community safe during the time we had no vaccine or testing. And we've used public health as our North Star in this work, at the same time while making sure we get our economy open and getting our kids in school. Dayton fought hard to make sure our kids were safe, that they got vaccines, but then also made sure that when we did, when younger people couldn't have vaccines, that they had masks to keep them safe too. And I called on Mike DeWine last year to make sure, instead of him just wringing his hands, begging people to do the right thing, that he stood up for schools. Because I think the most important thing we learned during the pandemic, in, in, including how when we're in this together, we can really make a difference that our schools and children, children must be in schools and we have to make them as safe as possible. Having masks in schools made our school safer. Mike DeWine was too weak to stand up to radicals in his party to even protect our children. This next question goes to you first, Ms. Whaley. Several Ohioans also asked questions about abortion rights. This one came from Michael in Cincinnati who wrote, Governor DeWine has advocated for restricting abortion access and taken steps to remove a citizen's right to choose the best path for themselves and their family. How do you plan to protect people's right to privacy and abortion access? Well, Lucy, this is really personal to me. As a woman, I've spent my entire career fighting for abortion access and even fought to keep the Dayton Clinic open working with NARAL. And look, what we've seen across all candidates running for governor, both Republican and Democrat, is that I'm the only candidate that has been pro-choice my entire career. And while I'm very excited that Mayor Cranley has joined us in allyship, in fighting for a woman's right to an abortion, this is too important when Roe is about to fall to have someone in the governor's seat that just decided a few months before he announced for governor he was pro-choice. Look, as governor, I'll make sure that I veto any bill that attacks access for women's health care and abortion rights. I'll make sure that we have a pro-choice doctor as a head of public health in our cabinet. But you don't have to take my word for this. Every single organization that has been on the front lines fighting for abortion access in our communities has endorsed me. From Planned Parenthood Action of Ohio to Pro-Choice Ohio, they are the group that I trust in this work, and I am incredibly honored to have their full support. Mr. Cranley, same question to you. Um, how do you plan to protect people's right to privacy and abortion access? I am pro-choice, and as governor, I promise to veto any effort to undermine reproductive freedom. As Nan said correctly, I was raised Catholic and started out in a different place on this issue. Like Tim Ryan, like Joe Biden, like many others. About 15 years ago, when my wife Dina, who's here, and I started a family, we had to go so, through some very personal, private fertility decisions. And during that process, and by the way, it worked out well, Joseph is here. During that process, it became obvious to me what my wife already was telling me, that government had no role in reproductive decisions. And so I am pro-choice. And I agree that this issue is gonna take on importance this year with the Supreme Court decisions expected this summer. And it's likely the Republicans will keep a majority in the General Assembly. So the only way to stop these attacks when it reverts to the state is to get a veto stamp. And the only way to get a veto stamp is to win. Teresa Fetter, one of the greatest champions of reproductive freedom in the history of the state, she and I are the best ticket to win because we have delivered for our people by raising economic conditions. And I believe that's what is the most likely reason swing voters will decide one way or the other. Who can deliver better economic progress? And I have done that in Cincinnati. You're watching Voters First, the 2022 Ohio Gubernatorial Democratic Primary Debate, a presentation of the Ohio Debate Commission in AARP Ohio. Our partners for this debate include the Char and Chuck Fowler Family Foundation, the Cleveland Foundation, the George Gund Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Murray and Agnes Seasongood Good Government Foundation, Tecovis Foundation, City Club of Cleveland and the Ohio Association of Broadcasters. Thank you for being with us. So a 
On Monday afternoon, the Ohio Debate Commission and Central State University talked with dozens of high school students from the Cleveland area Thurgood Marshall Oratorical Debate Program and college students from four universities during community roundtable discussions. They posed this question and it will go first to you, Mr. Cranley. According to the Canton Repository, there is a constant rate of 10 to 40 percent of college graduates moving to other states. What will you implement to highlight opportunities for the youth in Ohio to not only ensure, but to raise the career retention rates in the state? Lucy, I think this is a critical issue. We have to grow again. So much of the state is used to decline of people moving away. We need a leader that can get results. Cincinnati was like that. It was losing population my whole life. And now it's growing again twice as fast as the state of Ohio, reducing poverty one and a half times faster than the state of Ohio. And the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati State and Xavier and all of our other universities are part of that. What makes vibrancy happen are our values. Prioritize diversity and inclusion. It's because we prioritize racial justice in Cincinnati that made our comeback possible. Same with LGBTQT rights. We became, with Columbus, the first city in Ohio to get a 100% score from the human rights campaign. These things matter to young people, to retaining young people. Teresa Fetter and I also have a plan to invest millions in community college to reduce tuition, but to upgrade graduate level education because that has been proven to be the number one reason why you can attract businesses, jobs, which then keep our graduates here. But fundamentally, we're either growing or dying. And too much of Ohio thinks that we can't grow again. I know we can because I help lead our Cincinnati back to growth. Same question to you, Ms. Whaley. Uh, what will you implement to highlight opportunities for the youth in Ohio to not only ensure but to raise the career retention rates in the area? Yes, Lucy, the answer to Ohio's uh, adults, young adults, can't be if you want a good job, move to Columbus. Right? Lots of young people want to live near their parents and grandparents. They want to be able to raise their family in that supportive environment but too often they can't because they can't find a good paying job. And this has been the way that the state has been investing for the past two decades. Uh, making sure they had this failed policy idea that if they cut taxes on multinational co corporations and the wealthy, that suddenly all of our communities would get stronger and richer. It clearly hasn't worked. They cut funding to our communities so they couldn't grow and build. And frankly, now our largest export is our college graduates, because they have to look for a good paying job, if not in Columbus, on the coast. It is not an answer for our state. That's why I'm really proud of our jobs plan, to make sure that one good job is enough, no matter what community you live in. We want to do that by investing in new technologies like renewable energies and battery technology, making sure that we have good union paying jobs in manufacturing, and making sure that the state actually funds communities to grow small business. Now, this is something really important to my uh, running mate, Cheryl Stevens, who talks about how small businesses are typically women-owned and African-American-owned, and we can build them all across communities, big and small. And I'm also talking about uh, small business, not like the federal government does, where it's 500 employees or less in Dayton and other communities. That's a big company. 50 employees or less, and really making sure that we grow the next generation of entrepreneurs so young people you, have a choice to live in the communities they grew up in. Thank you. This next question goes to you first, Ms. Whaley. Our next question focuses on police accountability and reform, coming from Cynthia in Canal Winchester. She writes, if elected and the leadership in the House and Senate refuses to pass any legislation addressing police misconduct, will you sign an executive order ending qualified immunity, which is a series of legal precedents that protect government officials, including police officers, accused of violating constitutional rights? You know, every family in Ohio, regardless of what they look like, deserve to go to bed uh, without violence in their community, and they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect by our police officers. As mayor of Dayton after the George Floyd murder, 
we recognized we need to have a better relationship with our police, police officers in our community. So I brought over 100 members of the community together, activists, clergy members, the police, uh, to really d find a way forward for our police departments to really work with our communities. They had many recommendations that have already been put in place, like the alternative response model. So when you call 911 in Dayton, you may get a police officer if you need one, you may get an ambulance, you may get a mental health provider, because we need to make sure that we're providing the service that the community needs at the time. We also recognize that too often black Ohioans are over-policed, over-sentenced and overcharged in, this, in, in our communities, and making sure that we're really investing in police, increasing the number of officers, and making sure that any time anyone at, interacts with an officer, they're treated with dignity and respect. You have to hold both ideas in your head at the same time. And as governor, I'd do that again, working with our activist community, working with clergy, working with the criminal justice community to move our state forward. There are many actions that can be done, but right now we have a governor that's been in office since I was 10 months old and typically only interested in what the criminal justice system wants, not what the whole community needs. Thank you. So Ms. Whaley, would you sign an executive order ending qualified immunity? Look, I think this is way more qualified than just qualified immunity issues. I think it is more about how police officers really interact with, with citizens, and absolutely, citizens deserve to be treated with dignity and respect any time there's an incident or in, any time they are in with police officers. Same question to you, Mr. Cranley. If elected and the leadership in the House and Senate refuses to pass any legislation addressing police misconduct, will you sign an executive order ending qualified immunity? Police community issues have been a defining issue that I have grappled with my career. 22 years ago, our city was boycotted by civil rights leaders after several killings of unarmed black men by our police. Damien Lynch III, civil rights leader in Cincinnati, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss Jr. in Cleveland, they said don't spend money in Cincinnati until they change things. I'm proud to say that today they want this former mayor of Cincinnati to be governor of Ohio. We've made real change. As I mentioned earlier, shootings are down, but arrests are down 50% over 20 years on an annual basis. We've made our city safer by arresting fewer people. There are three elements to our reform, transparency, use of force changes, and community-oriented policing. As mayor, I became, we became the first big city to get body cameras on the vast majority of our police officers, and now, they come on automatically, so you don't have to worry about someone forgets or doesn't forget to turn it on. After the murder of George Floyd, I helped write a report on police reform nationally. And then, when there were cries for further reform, undisciplined reform for officers who do something wrong, that they are fired and stay fired or stay punished and not get returned by arbitrators, I led the effort, the first major city in America, to get arbitration reform to make it easier to discipline officers. So Mr. Cranley, would you sign an executive order ending qualified immunity? No, but I would do this. I will sign an executive order that will license police officers and as the executive of the state, we have the ability to license officers and we will have use of force changes. We will have body cameras on officers across the state. We will also put in the kind of uh, community-oriented policing that we did in Cincinnati. Thank you. This next question goes to you first, Mr. Cranley. Uh, it was submitted by Rebecca in Cincinnati. She asks, approximately one in 10 children will be sexually abused in Ohio. As governor, how do you plan to protect children from predators? Will you pledge to reform the statute of limitations on rape, enact grooming laws, or create a civil look-back window? Absolutely, I believe the statute of limitations should be lifted for rape. And I, I have to defer on a question like this to my running mate, Teresa Fetter, um, who discovered when she got elected uh, to the General Assembly that if, obviously we all know if you rape somebody, it's a felony, but if you pay, to rape the person through an act of prostitution where you're 
uh, raping a child. It's a misdemeanor. It was a misdemeanor. Teresa Fetter led the effort in a bipartisan fashion to change that. And she has become the nationally known champion, nationally known champion of human traffic survivors. Over the last month, Teresa and I have traveled the state on what we've called our social justice tour, where exonerees of the Innocence Project, a project that I started and have gotten, this project has gotten 34 people out of prison, some of whom I got out personally, and women that Teresa has helped stand up for themselves as survivors of human trafficking. And we did this, which was kind of a strange way to start a main political campaign, because we wanted voters to know what our moral compass was, that in all cases, we would be thinking about those who have been most abused by society, innocent people in prison, women who were trafficked, girls that were trafficked at the age of 11. Thank you, Mr. Cranley. Same question to you, Ms. Whaley. Um, as governor, how do you plan to protect children from predators? Will you pledge to reform the statute of limitations on rape, enact grooming laws, or create a civil look back window? Yes, absolutely. And, and look, I think this is just one of those things, again, that has not been addressed because there's not enough women in politics. If we had women leaders really paying attention to this and more women as leaders across the state, we would see more of these issues being figured out by policies that have mostly been written by men. Uh, and look, I have walked the streets of Dayton with people that have been former, um, former in the sex trafficking industry, right, and have seen them work with women to try to pull them out. And a lot of this also ties to the addiction crisis in our communities. Now in Dayton, I'm really proud of the work we've done to bring people together. Uh, when we led, when I be, was mayor, we, we became, when I was first elected mayor, we actually led the nation in accidental overdose deaths. We did two things. We first sued the drug companies to hold them accountable. We were the first city in the state, the fourth in the country, and we won to make sure that funding goes to addiction. And secondly, we made sure that we started treating addiction like the disease it is, that it is. Lots of people have no choice in the throes of addiction. They can't get services. They can't get the help they need when they're ready to take it. And so they stay in this cycle of violence. Ohio deserves better. We need to make sure that we're fully funding mental health and addiction services like we have been able to do in Dayton through local funding. But there are some communities that are too poor to do that, and they need a state partner. This could also really affect and make us not fourth in the country in human trafficking in Ohio right now. Thank you, Ms. Whaley. This next question goes to you first. Several Ohioans wrote questions about supporting the LGBTQ plus community. Shane from Columbus specifically asks, if elected governor, what can we expect to see your administration do to protect LGBTQ plus Ohioans? Yes, I've learned in Dayton that an inclusive community is a community that really can thrive. And we have been um, uh, really proud. I've been really proud of the work that I've done in Dayton. In Dayton, uh, we too, on the first year we were able to, to get on um, the human relations uh, the index, we were actually over 100%. They actually give you bonus points. And I was proud of that work. I was the first mayor in the state, and the first person in the state, actually, to perform a same-sex marriage an hour and three minutes after Obergefell, and continued to provide marriages free for anybody who wanted to come that following week to celebrate. We were the first city in the state to ban conversion therapy, and even before marriage was a, 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 a law for, for folks, we had a domestic partnership in the city. And I've been proud to partner with Equality Ohio so they bring the issues to us and we can move towards uh, uh, open community for LGBT uh, folks and family across Dayton. And Dayton isn't necessarily a city that you actually think, usually you think of the bigger cities, but I'm proud of the work that I've done with the LGBT community and Equality Ohio. As governor, I'll do the same thing. We need to make sure right now in Ohio, if you don't live in one of the larger cities in the state, you can actually be thrown out of your house if you're gay. It's unacceptable. We need to make sure that people have protections uh, for housing and employment, and I'll work with Equality Ohio to make that happen. Same question to you, Mr. Cranley. If elected governor, what can we expect to see your administration do to protect LGBTQ plus Ohioans? I will fight with them, stand with them. And I think there is, in particular, the importance to stand with our trans community. 
which is being demonized all across this country. Teresa and I will always be a moral voice, but more than voice, action. Like race relations, Cincinnati had a terrible history on LGBTQT rights. I'm proud. I thought, according to Mr. Seelbach, my former colleague, that we were the first city to ban conversion therapy, but I'm glad we both did it, and, and, and we'll let uh, that get worked out later. But the important thing is that we did it. We yes, were the I'm first city in Ohio to provide comprehensive medical services for our trans citizens and our trans employees of the city of Cincinnati. Along with Columbus, the first city in Ohio to become 100% scored by the Human Rights Campaign. And at the beginning of my career, before some of the politics on it moved and it became more popular, I fought to add sexual orientation after a transgender man was murdered in my city. And that became the first LGBTQT friendly law in many years in the city of Cincinnati. That followed by a civil rights movement to repeal this odious provision of the city charter. I believe that embracing people has been with race relations improvements, the cornerstone of our city's comeback, and it'll be the cornerstone of Ohio's comeback. Thank you, Mr. Cranley. This next question goes to you first. Political scandals in Ohio, will, in Ohio were also a hot topic in the questions submitted by people in Ohio. Zach from Strongsville, Sophie from Columbia, and Kathy Ann from Fairview Park were just a few of the people wanting to know how you're going to fix it. Sophie specifically writes, the last few years in Ohio state politics has been a corruption-fueled nightmare. What would you do to restore faith in state government in general and specifically at the state house? The most important thing we can do is fire Mike DeWine. Mike DeWine appointed the utility commissioners that gave us HB6, which according to the FBI, is the most corrupt bill in the country. This is a bill that raises everybody's monthly energy bills to bail out a coal company in Indiana. But that should be no surprise because a couple years ago, he was an apologist for ECOT, the previous worst scandal in the history of the state. Mike DeWine has consistently overseen corruption. And guess what? Over time, the average person is poorer than they were before he got into public life or before he became governor relative to the national economy. In Cincinnati, it's been the opposite. But the first thing we're going to do, like Dick Celeste, the great Democratic governor, is fire the utility commissioners because they're not ut public utility commissioners, they're private utility commissioners. When Dick Celeste ran and was elected in 1982, he said he would fire the utility commissioners, and he did. And at midnight, when I'm sworn in, I will fire the utility commissioners and replace them with commissioners committed to clean energy, protecting the consumer. And we will reinvest in renewable energy. And in all cases, we will act honorably and ethically and put the people first. His corruption led to taking money out of your pocket to give it to the special interest. Teresa Fetter and I have a different idea, which is take money from the special interest Thank you, Mr. and create a dividend for you. Same question to you, Ms. Whaley. The last few years in Ohio, state politics has been a corruption-fueled nightmare. What would you do to restore faith in state government in general and specifically at the State House? To be named, as Ohio has, as the most corrupt state house in the country takes a lot of work uh, by the FBI, frankly. And any corruption, big or small, is a breach of trust in our communities and in our democracy. And frankly, uh, Mike DeWine has been, has been complicit in this whole piece. He got First Energy to fund his campaign, and in return, he gave them everything they wanted, including a billion dollar bailout we're paying every single month on our electric bill. He, they wanted their top lobbyist to be the top utility regulator. Done. When First Energy settled with the Department of Justice in the largest settlement in American history from this corruption scandal, they admitted that they paid the guy $4 million to look out for them, not us. And look, this has been going on for decades. These guys, big donor, electronic classrooms of tomorrow where they had no students, sucking money out of public schools. 
big donor, payday lenders, egregious interest rates, sucking money out of our, of, out of our, our, our poor communities. The first thing I did when I announced I was running for governor was to put forward an anti-corruption plan to make sure the politicians don't police themselves, that we make sure that we stop the revolving door. You can work for the government or you can work for corporations, you can't work for both, and making sure that there's transparency on who's, who's spending money in our campaigns. Ohio you, deserves so much better than the corrupt government they're getting from the State House. Thank you, Ms. Whaley. This is going to be our last question. We're running out of time, so you'll each have 60 seconds to answer it. Um, it'll go first to you, Ms. Whaley. A number of uh, people in the state submitted questions related to climate change, including Andrea from Cincinnati. She specifically wrote, what will you do to help make Ohio a leader in mitigating climate change? You have 60 seconds. Well, Lucy, I think this is really important to make sure that we can have good paying jobs by investing in the future economy of renewable energy. And this first energy scandal, House Bill 6, actually rolled back all the renewable energy standards in Ohio. That's why Michigan and Pennsylvania are eating our lunch right now, because we're not even investing in this opportunity of the future of our jobs and good paying jobs too. Now, as I mentioned, I'm excited that I am working and, and have been endorsed by the Ohio Environmental Council, Senator Sherrod Brown, and over 190 elected officials across the state because they know I'm the candidate that can get this done, that one good job is enough at the same time while investing in future technologies. Too often, because our state is so corrupt, we've been investing in old technologies because that's where the big donors are. We need to be investing in our future, in our children, in child care, but also making sure that these good paying jobs that are the future are right here in Ohio. Mr. Cranley, same question to you, 60 seconds. As I mentioned, I led the effort to build the largest solar farm ever built by a city in America. The city government services of Cincinnati is carbon neutral. It's in Highland County. It created jobs. After we broke ground, Mike DeWine signed a bill that says local government can now tell farmers that they can't build wind and solar. Think about that. The party that's supposed to believe in property rights now thinks they know better than farmers. I believe farmers should be encouraged to do wind and solar. And as I said earlier, I will expand wind and solar around the state. You know what else I think farmers should be able to grow if they want? Marijuana. That's why I'm, and Teresa and I are leading the effort to legalize it, to tax it, and to create good paying jobs. In fact, 30,000 jobs that pay 60,000 a year to build the infrastructure and the clean energy that our state needs. Thank you. That concludes the questioning portion of the debate. We have a few minutes left for closing remarks. Each of you will have 90 seconds. Nan Whaley, we begin with you. Thank you, and thank you, Central State, for hosting us today. Uh, this election is simple. I believe that Ohio deserves better. For 30 years, we've had the same guys in charge at the State House. They've gotten rich, and Ohio families have fallen further and further behind. It's time for a change. As mayor of Dayton, I brought folks together to, to tackle some of the toughest issues, and each time we came out stronger. We did it by focusing on solutions, not partisan politics or petty egos. We could use the same attitude at the State House today. As governor, I want your pay to go up, your bills to go down, and your state government to finally work for you. We'll do that by raising wage for all Ohioans, include by, by in investing in small business, growing our manufacturing base, and raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. We'll also pass universal preschool like we did in Dayton and make sure that folks' medicine bills go down. But we also have to attack the rampant corruption that's been on, been on display under Mike DeWine's leadership. On May 3rd, I'm asking for your vote because I think it's time to have a governor for the middle class and from the middle class that will fight for the middle class. Thank you. Mr. Cranley, you have 90 seconds. We're all Democrats. Uh, we share the same values. We have the same goals. This primary is about one thing. Who is best to beat Mike DeWine? The fact is that when it comes to economic growth, and growth in general, my record is better than Mike DeWine. 
Over his career, the average wage in Ohio has gone down. The average wage in my city has gone up. Poverty's gone down one and a half times faster than the state of Ohio. And we grew twice as fast as the state of Ohio. When Teresa and I travel the state, we hear from communities that feel like the future is behind us, that we can't have growth and economic opportunities for our kids and grandkids. But I know we can, because my city was like yours. It was in decline, and now it's growing again. And we have a plan to guarantee 30,000 jobs that pay 60,000 to build infrastructure, legalize marijuana, tax it, put those taxes into those jobs, and to create a dividend that will build up the middle class of the state and help with inflation. And I believe if we Democrats are going to win, we have to nominate a team that can meaningfully say that we can improve your community and your life. I have done that by getting people out of prison who are innocent, which frankly is Thank really you, hard, Cranley. and turning a city around. We'll do the same for Ohio. Thanks. That concludes today's debate. I'd like to thank Nan Whaley and John Cranley for joining us. This debate was presented by the Ohio Debate Commission. Funding was provided by AARP Ohio. This program was made possible by the following organizations, the Shar and Chuck Fowler Family Foundation, the Cleveland Foundation, the George Gund Foundation, and the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation the Murray and Agnes Seasongood Good Government Foundation, Tacovas Foundation, City Club of Cleveland, and the Ohio Association of Broadcasters. And we'd like to thank Central State University for hosting this event. Finally, I'd like to thank our audience here at Central State and across the Buckeye State for joining us. I'm Lucy May, host of 91.7 WVXU's Cincinnati Edition. Have a great evening.